In this lecture, I'm going to show you several different ways of making amines. Specifically, we're going to look at making alkyl amines and then aryl amines. The alkyl amines are made through a process called the Gabriel synthesis, or we can reduce nitriles and azide compounds. And aryl amines are made through SNAR, nucleophilic aromatic substitution, or electrophilic aromatic substitution that puts a nitro group on the benzene ring and then reducing it. Both SNAR and nitration are reactions that we looked at in a previous chapter. Before we start looking at new material, let's take a minute to review previous material. And so here is your first review quiz. Pause the video and see if you can answer this question. Okay, this reaction proceeds via a simple SN2 mechanism. The mechanism for that, this is the azide ion. Sodium is a spectator ion and floats away. And the azide has two nucleophilic ends. Either one of them will attack the alpha carbon right here, bump off the bromide as a leaving group, and we end up with one azetobutane. The reason that this review quiz showed up, and this seems like a fairly easy one, was to review the concept of phase transfer catalysts. So if you were confused, wondering what this does in the reaction, its purpose is to carry the azide ion from likely an aqueous solvent to the butyl bromide, which would be dissolved in an organic solvent. So this reviews the concept of phase transfer catalysts. Here's another review quiz. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can come up with this one. This is a synthesis reaction and should take a little longer. In the first step of this synthesis, there are two different ways of converting an alkyl halide into a carboxylic acid while simultaneously adding a carbon to your compound. And the first one is by turning your alkyl halide into a Grignard reagent, then plugging the Grignard into an electrophilic carbon dioxide, and then capping off the carboxylate that you form with a proton by doing an acidic workup. Alternately, you could use sodium cyanide as a nucleophile, participates in an SN2 reaction and bumps off the bromide, and then we hydrolyze the cyanide, which is a carboxylic acid derivative. We can hydrolyze that all the way to a carboxylic acid using heat. The delta symbol here re represents heat that we're adding to the system, and that usually means we're doing more than just putting a proton on. In the second part of the synthesis, we need to add a halogen to the alpha position of a carboxylic acid. And this is the hell volhard zielinski reaction. It requires a molecular halogen, Br2, Cl2, or I2, in the presence of a phosphorus trihalide catalyst. We didn't look at the mechanism for this reaction. It's based on the enol content of a carboxylic acid from the previous chapter. but this will put a halogen on at the alpha position. And in fact, we looked at this exact synthesis in the previous chapter. I just wanted to take a minute to pause and think about what these charges are doing right here. And so the third step of the reaction just requires you to add ammonia. Aqueous conditions, water is an appropriate solvent for that reaction. Others might work as well. And the mechanism for that involves first the ammonia deprotonating the carboxylic acid. And this is inevitable and has nothing to do ultimately with the substitution that I'm trying to um, effectuate at the alpha position. The ammonia pulls the proton off simply because the carboxylic acid is an acid and ammonia is a base. And once that happens, now the ammonia can no longer attack the carbonyl group. That negative charge on that oxygen is going to repel the partial negative charge of the nitrogen, and that facilitates the nucleophilic attack away from that carbonyl group at the alpha carbon. We bump off the bromide, and then there's no deprotonation step. It just stops once it gets to here, and this is an actual amino acid. I'll make sure I get the right one here. This is alanine, an amino acid. So this is a way of converting an alkyl halide using inorganic carbon to a carboxylic acid, the helvol hard zielinski reaction, puts the halogen at the alpha position, and then ammonia washes it off and replaces it with the sphitter ion um, amino acid. Making 
amines seems like a straightforward nucleophilic reaction. Uh, the ammonia is a good nucleophile, alkyl halides are a common electrophile, and the nitrogen can come over here, participate in a backside attack, SN2 reaction, and bump off the bromide. A couple of problems occur. First, there's two moles of ammonia that are required in this reaction, and that's because something has to come along and deprotonate this nitrogen after it pushes off the bromide. And in the overall stoichiometry, it looks like we're making HBr, but that's a strong acid, so the truth is one of the nitrogens will participate in the backside nucleophilic attack, and one of them acts as a base. I didn't show the mechanism for that because this really isn't a very effective way of producing amines. And the reason for this is your product is also a nucleophile. So not only, as soon as you start building up this uh, one propanamine, now you have both ammonia and propanamine competing as nucleophiles to attack that carbon right there. And the propanamine is at least as good at, as the ammonia, or fairly close to the ammonia in terms of its nucleophilic ability. It is now sterically hindered because of the presence of the propyl group, but the propyl group is also electron donating, which increases the amount of electron density on that nitrogen and makes it a better nucleophile. So the products, this is not, propanamine is not going to be the only product I get. I'm also going to end up with a second equivalent of alkyl group added to the nitrogen. And here is the example from your textbook, and I, I like this example because it gave me the percent yields. So instead of bromopropane, I'm changing now to one bromooctane. When you add the ammonia into this one, you're going to get some of the primary amine, and then the primary amine will react with other equivalents of your alkyl halide to produce your secondary amine. And the yields of these are about the same, which means that you probably only want one of these in your synthesis, and your contamination is nearly 50, is nearly equal to the one that you want. So this is not a useful synthesis. And a lot of you during the chemical company activity were making amines by simply mixing alkyl halides with ammonia. And I didn't say much because chemical engineers will do this, but as chemists, we want better. And so this is not a synthesis that you want to employ on an exam. Instead, there's a synthesis called the Gabriel synthesis, which uh, on paper is a beast. But in the laboratory, it produces a much higher yield, so it's preferable. And it's a two-step process. We take an alkyl halide, and we add, instead of just adding ammonia, we add n potassiophthalidamide, and this is the solvent, dimethylformamide, and then we follow it up with hydrazine and ethanol as our solvent. This reagent, n potassiophthalidamide is actually produced, and you can buy it, so it's not part of the organic mechanism that's important, but in case you're curious, if you use, i got to say this carefully, thalidomide and react it with potassium hydroxide, the hydroxide deprotonates it, and then you end up with this n potassiophthalidamide. So that's where that comes from, but when you're showing your mechanism, you just start with this compound right here, and you also ignore the potassium because it's a spectator ion. The first step of the reaction is actually quite straightforward. It's a nucleophilic SN2 attack of this nitrogen of the potassiophthalidamide reacting with the alpha carbon, displacing the leaving group, and we have loaded our alkyl group onto the nitrogen right there. So conceptually what we need to do now is carve this nitrogen out of this compound and we have the product that we want without the same yield considerations. Now, this product of the first step is an imide. It's a diacylamine, meaning that you have a nitrogen connected to two acyl groups. And you can hydrolyze this using aqueous acid, but that's not typically what's done. Typically, they use a compound called hydrazine. Evidently, it works better. And the hydrazine, shown here in blue, will carve that nitrogen out and give it the two hydrogens that it needs, and we end up with our final product that carving it out process is mechanistically rather extensive. So breathe deep. And this actually is not that different from mechanisms that we saw in the chapter on carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, and so I've tried to show you kind of the repetition of these steps. There is a nucleophilic attack. The hydrazine comes in and attacks the carbonyl group. 
This is done under, under base conditions, so the negatively charged oxygen doesn't need to be resonance stabilized. You have a nucleophilic attack by the nitrogen. The same hydrazine is going to come along and deprotonate your nucleophile. So again, first, first step is nucleophilic attack. Then we have a deprotonation of the nucleophile. Now this oxide ion collapses down and breaks one of the two bonds that we need to break in order to carve that amine out of this compound. Once we've done that, we actually form an enolate resonance. Well, this is a amide resonance. Um, so we have to protonate that nitrogen. So there's a nucleophilic attack, deprotonation of our nucleophile, and internal nucleophilic attack where the oxide ion falls down and pops off the weaker, the better leaving group, and then we protonate the nitrogen. The second half of this reaction involves the same four steps, although they're in a slightly different order. So the other end of the hydrazine flails around until it plugs into that carbonyl group. So that's the nucleophilic attack. We deprotonate the nitrogen. Sorry, the, yeah, the nucleophile that was a nitrogen. And then we have, instead of an internal nucleophilic attack, which was the third step of the previous half of this reaction, now you pre-protonate your leaving group. The internal nucleophilic attack now bounces off the final nitrogen. And here now we have the amine that we wanted. This product right here, the reason we went through all this was so that it only reacted once. We only wanted the nitrogen nucleophile to react one time with the alkyl halide. And so will this product react with the alkyl halide? And the answer is no, because we did it in two separate reaction containers. If you go back to the original layout, our synthetic scheme, here's the alkyl halide. Here we added the potassium thalidomide. And then we carved the final product out using hydrazine. And this product right here never can comes into direct contact with our original alkyl halide. And that's how we solve that problem of getting too many alkylation events on the nitrogen. On our original map, we wanted to discuss synthesizing alkyl amines through the Gabriel synthesis and reduction and then synthesizing aryl amines through SNAR and then nitration reduction. So far we've looked at the mechanism for the Gabriel synthesis. Now let's talk about synthesizing alkyl amines through reduction. That generally is accomplished by reducing either azido compounds or nitriles. The azido compounds and nitriles can be made directly by nucleophilic substitution of alkyl halides. We saw the synthesis of azido compounds in the review quiz. You can reduce those with lithium aluminum hydride followed by a water workup or through catalytic hydrogenation to produce the amines. Now, which of these syntheses you use depends on what your amine needs to look like. Notice how with the azido compounds, the amine is converted directly into an, sorry, the azido compound is converted directly into an amine. But in the nitrile compounds, the original R group gets both a carbon and an amine. So if you need to grow your R group by a carbon and also end up with an amine, then you'd want to make sure to use the cyanide as a nucleophile when you attack your alkyl halide. You can make secondary and tertiary amines as well. These are typically done by reducing amides. So an amide is a carbonyl group next to a nitrogen, much like a carboxylic acid is a carbonyl group next to an alcohol. The amide is a carbonyl group next to what looks like an amine. And this also involves reduction using lithium aluminum hydride or water and that gives you your amine. And here is a secondary amide becoming a secondary amine. And this is a tertiary amide becoming a tertiary amine. Mechanistically, let's break this down just a little bit because this is another lengthy mechanism. So big picture, I have an amide and I want an amine. I'm going to accomplish that with lithium aluminum hydride I went ahead and used deuterium so you can see exactly where it is that these new hydrogens are coming from, followed by a water workup. And I want to explain both the mechanism and why the water workup is necessary. In the first step of the mechanism, the aluminum hydride, lithium is a spectator ion and floats away, so the aluminum hydride transfers a hydride directly into the carbonyl group 
to produce an oxide ion this is a very strong base so having an oxide ion is not a big deal for the solvent this then plugs into the aluminum to form this complex right here and so first two steps a hydride transfer followed by a Lewis acid base reaction to generate this complex in the past when we used lithium aluminum hydride then the acidic workup would unravel this complex the acidic workup isn't necessary because the complex unravels by itself the nitrogen's lone pairs will drop down and just push off the aluminum and the oxygen the whole nine yards and we're almost to our final compound we have a carbon and the nitrogen the carbonyl group has now been clipped off and we just need that pi bond to be reduced so a second equivalent of the aluminum hydride will donate a proton or in this case a deuterium into the system and we end up with our final product and again if we have our final product why do we need to do the water workup and the answer is well that hydrogen is a little bit acidic if you have a very strong base which we do so the aluminum hydride will just keep going and rips the hydrogen off of the amine that you produce the uh, equilibrium for this one is actually about 50 50 the conjugate acid of this reaction is molecular hydrogen I'm keeping track of the deuteriums that's why it looks a little different than H2 it has a pKa of about 35 although that's difficult to measure experimentally so there's some uncertainty with that the nitrogen right here with a neutral charge has a pKa of about 36 so this reaction is in approximate equilibrium when we add the water to the system the water will react with any of the residual aluminum hydride or any of the deprotonated amine to give you back your amine so this is yet another example of when we got to the product we wanted but because the solution was basic we went past the product and had to do some type of post treatment to put the hydrogen back on the product this is a good time to take a minute just to review how awesome lithium aluminum hydride is and all the different things that we've seen it do the lithium aluminum hydride can react with aldehydes ketones epoxides carboxylic acids and esters and we looked at all of those reactions in previous chapters and noticed that in every case we end up producing an alcohol sometimes a primary alcohol sometimes a secondary alcohol and the epoxide whether it's primary or secondary depends on the structure of the epoxide notice in red that every other time that we've used lithium aluminum hydride there's been an acidic workup but when we make amides we don't do an acidic workup we do a water workup instead the reason for that is under acidic conditions water can hydrolyze your amide all the way to a carboxylic acid so if you're producing an amide via lithium aluminum hydride you have to be more careful when you're working this up so that the amide doesn't get hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid this wheel right here the lithium aluminum hydride wheel contains all the reactions that we've seen for lithium aluminum hydride this semester and the only mechanisms that you're not supposed to know are this one right here for the azido compounds and then the nitriles but the rest of these are all mechanisms that uh, that you have learned and possibly forgotten next on the list synthesizing aerolamines we're going to look at doing that via two different ways. One is SNAR and the other is nitration and reduction. So let's look at SNAR. This is a slide from a previous chapter, only instead it used to contain methoxide. We can put amide in there or an alkyl amide. And as long as you have a benzene ring with a halogen and electron withdrawing group, then the amide can plug directly into the benzene ring aromaticity is lost in this first step and then the electrons cycle back out again and push off the chloride two steps the first step is the rate determining step because we've lost our aromaticity and the kinetics are first order because there are two distinct compounds coming together in the rate determining step and this is not SN2 um, it is a special type of substitution called aromatic nucleophilic substitution and abbreviated as SNAR in that same chapter chapter that we talked about SNAR we also looked at electrophilic aromatic substitution SNAR works when you have an electron withdrawing group connected to your benzene ring 
electrophilic aromatic substitution works when you have an electron donating group like an alkyl group or um, an alcohol some other thing that pushes electron density into the ring system then we can do electrophilic aromatic substitution there is not a good way of directly adding an NH2 group to a ring system via electrophilic aromatic substitution instead using nitric acid and sulfuric acid you nitrate the ring system you add a nitro group to the ring system first um, usually the electron donating groups are ortho paradirecting so this is uh, sterically bulky we'll push your nitro group to the para position and then we're going to reduce the nitro group to the NH2 and this gives us an aniline derivative so we're trying to make aromatic amines we can do that via SNAR by pushing off a halogen or we can do it via electrophilic aromatic substitution in the first step and reduction in the second step reduction is a bit vague so let's be more specific reduction typically occurs with catalytic hydrogenation in the presence of the different catalysts we use for catalytic hydrogenation or in a, a mechanism that we're not going to look at the mechanistic details iron and tin can serve as electron sources and you couple that with hydrochloric acid as hydrogen sources and you can convert a nitro group to an NH2 group on an aromatic ring system now let's look at an example synthesis so consider P chloroaniline perichloroaniline and we want to make that from benzene so here's the product that I'm shooting for this is denoting a retrosynthetic arrow meaning that I'm going to make this from benzene there's two different ways of thinking about the retrosynthesis when I am looking at making a perichloroaniline then I need to add both the chlorine and the um, amino group on the benzene ring system so these represent the two different retrosynthetic routes if you flip a retrosynthesis around so I'm just going to invert the image right here and then draw the arrows going forward you can think about what reagents you would need to add in order to carry out the synthesis in the forward direction and thinking in a forward direction ultimately the question is which group do I put on first do I put on the nitro group first or do I put on the chlorine first if you put the nitro group on first you can reduce the nitro group to get to an NH2 if you skipped the reduction and tried to jump right to the chlorination remember that nitro groups in electrophilic aromatic substitution are meta directing substituents so the chlorine would not end up at the right position if you if you just try to run the chlorine directly it would end up on this meta position right here so we reduce the nitro group to get to the aniline and then we can use catalytic chlorination through electrophilic aromatic substitution to put the chlorine on here and this pathway doesn't work very well and the reason for that is this is an activating group it's a very strongly activating group it's too strongly activating and instead of getting one chlorine on there you're going to get at least three different chlorines on there with little ability to control the amount of chlorination that occurs so this pathway across the top here wouldn't work because you it would be difficult to get a monochloro product so the pathway on bottom where we put the chlorine on there first chlorine is also ortho para directing meaning that in this next step my nitro groups are going to end up at the para position or at the ortho positions but it is deactivating which means you get one on there and you're pretty much done and so we don't run into the problem of having too many things on the benzene ring we would need to run a column chromatograph in order to separate out the ortho nitro groups from the para nitro groups but that's pretty common then we would reduce the nitro group to get to our final product so this pathway right here would produce the best yield of the product that we're looking for this would be a nice moment to think about the mechanism of electrophilic aromatic substitution again because it's been a while so mechanistically this path down here on the bottom is one that we choose to follow involves two different rounds of electrophilic aromatic substitution electrophilic aromatic substitution is characterized by loss of the aromaticity and then a base pulling a hydrogen off to get back the aromaticity so the iron trichloride or the iron three chloride catalyst 
complexes with molecular Cl2 to form in the, in the preparation step to form this activated electrophile. The pi system reaches out into one of the chlorines and then the residual activated electrophile decomposes by ripping the hydrogen off of the same carbon that picked up the new chlorine. We broke the aromaticity in the rate determining step and then we get the aromaticity back in the second step. And the reaction stops here until you add in a different set of reagents. And so in the presence of sulfuric acid, nitric acid will break down to produce this ion, which is a very la active electrophile. The chlorine is orthopara directing because the lone pair from the chlorine can drop down into the ring system and help push into the electrophile. So those are the arrows that I'm showing there. In the same way that we broke the aromaticity in the first step, of the previous electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction and restored it in the second step. In our second EAS, or electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, we break the aromaticity in the first step and then we restore the aromaticity in the second step. So just back-to-back -back electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions in case you forgot what those look like. In order to get our final product, we have to add in the iron and the hydrochloric acid, and this isn't a mechanism that we're going to look at.